Hi, good afternoon and welcome to day one of Interdrone's public safety webinar series. My name is Leslie Wolf and I'm Interdrone's conference producer. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. Today's topic is image analysis at the pixel level uh, presented by our speaker, Gene Robinson. Before we get started, I've just got a couple of quick housekeeping notes. So regarding the audio, um, obviously make sure that your audio is unmuted, your volume is turned up. Any audio issues should be able to be fixed by just clicking on the little question mark on the upper corner of your screen. And from there, you can um, test your system and, and hopefully fix it. But if that doesn't do it, we do find sometimes that logging out of the webinar and then logging back in should fix any problems you're having. Okay, regarding questions, um, there will be a dedicated question and answer portion at the end of the webinar, um, but you're free to submit questions throughout um, just by going to the ask a question box and you can type in there. If you have any sort of technical questions or any issues that are going on, you can also type in the question box. We have staff on hand who are ready and able to help. All right, so our speaker, Gene Robinson, is president of the GRC Consulting Group. And um, with that, I will hand it over to you, Gene, to get us started. Thank you, Leslie. And thanks again to the Interdrone inter folks for having me on board. And uh, last time we did this, we were in Vegas, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do this live again in Dallas. But uh, we will make do with the, the best here, and we will see what we can do to get this thing pulled off. A uh, little caveat up front, I do live out in the country and sometimes the uh, internet is a little spotty. So if uh, we start getting breakups, then you might not get to see my smiling face all the way through the presentation, but uh, just to free up a little bandwidth, we may have to do that. But uh, we'll try to keep it this way and we'll try to go through uh, the, the, the session the way it was intended and, and we'll see how that goes. So, Anybody who has known me or known what I do, a search and rescue and public safety with drones has been what I've done for the past 15 years. And it has taken a very, very long time for us to get to this point, but we are there, thank goodness. And uh, what that has brought with it is just an explosion of data that we can now collect. We're talking still imagery that's very high resolution. We're talking LIDAR, we're talking 4K video. And for the longest time, that was kind of the bugaboo because we could collect so much data that IT would complain about where they were gonna store it, how they were gonna catalog it, you know, how do you retrieve it, that sort of thing. And uh, one of the things that uh, myself as an IT, 20 year IT professional, I, I get that. But uh, now when you can buy a terabyte drive for $50, uh, you know, that, that argument has kind of faded into the background. So we're, we're not concerned about that so much, but what we need to look at is what are we trying to get out of the imagery that we collect? And the industry has supported a very, very efficient data collection process for just about every application you can come up with. You've got uh, UGCS, you got Leachy, you got PIX4D here, and they are very, very good ground control softwares to help you collect all the data that you can collect. And you're, you're relatively assured that you're going to get 100% coverage. Uh, and, and these softwares have really, really come a long way to ensure that. Obviously, in something like search and rescue or public safety where you're working a disaster or that sort of thing, 100% coverage is a very, very important thing. So we've got that end of it covered, but it also promotes collecting even more data, right? So therein kind of lies the rub. We've gotten all these images and, and we, can, we can now stitch them together into ortho mosaics that are geo rectified and have all sorts of data. So we've got literally gigabytes of raw images that we use to produce uh, an ortho mosaic that's even bigger. So we've got this very large picture that has uh, a lot of good 
uh, georeference data in it. But again, it's not very portable and it's it's very difficult to, if you don't have the right computer to, to pull up a very large mosaic and drill down into the layers that it can carry and, and you know you might be denied seeing what data it does have in it. So if you were asked, we need to go find something in that three gigabytes of 3000 images that you've just collected what would you do if somebody said, you know, we'd like to find this invasive species of this plant or, you know, we had a boat go down and in, in, in the lake and, you know, you, you can take 3000 pictures of the lake. You still got to look through them. And then, you know, finally the nearest and dearest to my heart is, you know, how do you find the, that, that missing person that's out there? Well, really there's been only one way and that one way is, is you got to look through every single one of those 3,000 images that you just collected. And if you know, if you've heard, talk, heard me talk before, we, we call that squinting the images. Now, I didn't come up with that. That's a, an old World War II term. Camera is shaking. Okay. Uh, that is an old World War II term when you see the, the, the aerial photography that is collected by the aircraft and the, the guys get with the jeweler's loop and they get down there close and they, they look at things and pull out things on the images. So that's where that came from. And you have, have to actually look at each one of those images and use the standard issue Mark one eyeball, as I call it, to try to pull out the details that you're looking for. And not only does it take a trained eye, it takes somebody with a lot of patience. And quite frankly, you know, it, it gets very tiring and very, very difficult to do. So let's let's talk about the data that we collect. Let's see, this thing's wiggling real bad here. So let's see, fix that some. Okay, our aerial images are made up of colors and um, A JPEG image can, can contain up to 17.5 million colors. That's a lot of colors, right? Uh, and the human eye can only see about 12 million of those colors. Now, I mean, th that's 5 million colors that we could be missing out on. You think we could be missing something? Sure, we could. Uh, and there's another thing, if you're like me, there's this little thing called color blindness that could end up being an affliction that you have. Uh, I am, for example, in red, green, yellow color blind. And uh, that can be an advantage sometimes. Sometimes it can be a disadvantage. But these are all things that factor into whether you are successful at being able to extract the data that you need from all the raw images that you collect. Now, the colors that, and, and I'm gonna geek out a little bit on you guys and, and kind of go into what we're doing here so that you'll understand, but all the colors that make up our JPEG images are basically from the primary colors of red, green, and blue, RGB. So those are colors that all have a value. They go from zero to 255. And this little chart here shows you just exactly what each one of those colors looks like, what the, the chart looks like from zero to 255. And when you mix those colors together, it's how you end up with all the other colors that could be in a JPEG image. And we'll get into that a little deeper. So you've got 17.5 million colors there, and you've got a 20 plus megapixel camera that has taken that image. So the math is starting to get out of hand right now. Uh, I'm, I'm having a, a hard time counting the, the possible permutations with it. And that doesn't even count cameras that we've got coming up that could be 42, 48, and 50 megapixels coming up. So that's going to be an incredible increase in the amount of data that we can analyze. And I, for years, have felt that a computer should be able to help us with analyzing these images. 
And I have tried and tried and tried to, to I, as a software programmer, I've done some programming myself, unsuccessfully at trying to do this analysis. There was some work done by the University of Canberra out of Australia that they came close with it, but it was a command line sort of situation, not very friendly and it was very difficult to use, but it was close. And other than that, it's been some very high dollar military applications. So when I heard about this company, this, uh, this software company called Locate, that's L-O-C, the number eight, and it's, it's said, you say it, Locate, um, I did a backflip. I really, really wanted to find out just exactly what they were doing. I wanted to be involved, and more importantly, I wanted to use it in all my efforts for search and rescue. And uh, very happily, they were, uh, they were very receptive, and uh, I jumped on board with them, and I started helping them enhance it as much as I could and taking it out in the field and using it to, to try to locate those lost folks. And this is what we're going to tell you about today, because this really does help you pull that, that gargantuan task off of being able to pull information, actionable information, out of those thousands of images that you collect. So let's talk about that a little bit. Locate is a, a very portable software in that you can run it on just about any laptop, which is great because that's what we use out in the field. <clears throat> we use laptops and, and small computers that you know typically don't have a lot of horsepower. Um, another good thing about Locate is, is that it doesn't require the internet to run. So it's standalone, completely standalone. You can run it and off of batteries or anything else that for as long as your, your laptop will stay running and do image analysis in the field, which is very important because that's where we spend most of our time. And it is ex extremely fast. When I talk about looking at images, a really, really good squint, person who is looking at the images, if you gave them every image and they looked at it very closely and zoomed in on it, and actually tried to pull the details out of it, which my wife is very good at that. She's probably the best I know. And it takes her about two minutes to look at each image. So if you've got a thousand images, here comes the math again, that's 2000 minutes. That's a long time. That's a bunch of hours that you don't have in the field. So when you take something like locate and you are looking for something in those images, at two 20 megapixel images per second, you've just gone from 2,000 minutes to 2,000 seconds, right? Or no, actually, actually less than that, it's 1,000 seconds. So you've got several minutes there that uh, you, you can get that processing done and it's, it's very quick. Now, one of the things that I want to stress about Locate is, is that it locates colors. It finds specific colors in your image. So say for example, most people when they go out into the, the wild or they go walking about, what do they usually wear? They usually wear blue jeans, right? So blue jeans is a color that we can key on to look for in each one of these images. And it finds it very quickly. So. Let's go ahead and tell you how you do that. This is the screen, the viewer screen that comes with Locate. And there's a blue hat and we can take a sample off of that hat. And we call this the bloodhound method because it's kind of like giving the old bloodhound a little sniff of the t-shirt and tell him to go look for it. You're doing much the same thing with colors. You're telling the software, you see that little box that's, that's drawn right there in the middle of the screen Take those pixels and either average them together, or you can use a, just a single value if you like, which very narrowly defines your search. And you can use that as a basis to start your search with. So once you get that value done, and you can take multiple samples and, and build multiple color databases, you can go to the database, color database editor, 
and define the range that you want it to look for. So if you'll notice right there in the start color and the end color columns, you've got values, RGB values. They're, they're uh, from 12 all the way up to, it's pretty small for me, 158 or so. And it will show you a thumbnail of that color. So you've got a range that the software is able to work within. From there, you can go to the software and plug it in and run those images using that sample. Once it detects that, if, if it does detect that color in the, uh, uh, in the scan itself, it will pull that image out and it will draw a circle around the pixels that match your color. And this is at the rate of two images per second. So this thing is cranking along. And the good thing about it is, is that you don't have to stop the process to go and look at these images. The viewer that is in this particular package is one of the best ones that I've seen. Obviously you can use the, the Microsoft Photo Viewer or any of the other photo manipulation softwares that are out there but this one is specific to being able to manipulate your images and look at them very quickly and very specifically. If you'll notice at the bottom of that image there, you've got several buttons down there. Those are very, very quick, either keyboard or mouse button strokes that you can use to zoom in on it. If I wanted to, to look at that, what, what is in that circle and look at it very quickly, all I would have to do is hit the Z key on the keyboard or click that button with the mouse. And once I do that, it will zoom right into that and we see that it actually found two occurrences of the color blue that we are looking for. And if you'll notice on the left-hand side, it gives you the RGB values that you're using. And it also gives you the lat and lawn that is located in the EXIF information of that file. If you're using any of the drones today, most of the popular drones today, DJI's, uh, uh, Unique, um, uh, the, the, all of those, those aircraft will store the EXIF information or the Latlon information in the EXIF header of each one of the images. So there's some valuable information right there and you're just viewing the, the images. So from there, if we, if we did have an internet connection, and a lot of people are, you know, having hotspots on their phones, they've gotten, uh, like myself, uh, I'm on Verizon FirstNet, and uh, we get priority as a first responder, so we generally have much better cell service, even in some of the areas that are denied. So when I have that, I can click on the Show Map button at the bottom, and it will bring up a Google map. Gives you the lat and lawn, gives you the, the roadways that are near it, gives you a pin drop, and obviously, since you're doing a Google map, if you wanted to, you can do the satellite, and you get a contextual view, overhead view, of where that, look, that image is located with landmarks and everything that can be used to ground truth and go out and, and actually lay hands on the, the whatever the, the object is in that. Now, one of the things that we didn't get to include in this because it's a fairly short presentation is that there are output reports that are very, very small and portable and uh, I'll go back to that one. Very small and portable, they're in PDF format, and they can be sent very easily over your cell phone, over uh, SMS, emails, that sort of thing, that will contain thumbnails of whatever the, the target is that you found. Uh, it will contain the lat and lawn, national grid coordinates, and then a hyperlink that will also take you to this map. There are other reports that will tell you 
exactly what your range was. Like in this particular range, we are looking at approximately 215,000 different colors that we scan for. 215,000 colors. That certainly increases your odds of finding it over, over the one and 17.5 million that are that could be contained in a JPEG image. So with that quality report, we can either expand or contract the range. If we get too many false positives, and there, you know, if you if you make the range too big, you can have false positives that that it picks up on just about every little artifact that's within that that shade of blue and you don't want that. So you can use that to reduce the number of hits that you get. And there are other tools within Locate that allow you to sequentially increment it as well. So you can start off with a range of say 10 points above and 10 points below this particular value right here. And that's your range. You can automate the search so that if it doesn't find anything on the first pass, it will increment the range again by the number that you select, which 10, 15, 20, five, it doesn't matter. You can select it and it will rerun it. And it will rerun it until it starts finding targets. And then it allows you to intervene and, and look at the targets. Again, the most important thing about this and, and one of the, the best features of this is you don't stop the process. If you happen to start seeing images come up as being scanned and found, you can start viewing them immediately. You don't have to stop the process. It can continue on in the background. You can start putting information out immediately as soon as Locate pulls up and identifies those as a viable target. Now. One of the things that that uh, I kind of like about this is there are a group of utilities that come that they're available with Locate. And these are things that we have asked for or we would have been really, really nice to have in the past if we had had them. Uh, these are plug-in utilities that, that are available separately from the base package. And I'll go through those uh, pretty quickly. The extractor is something that is very, very useful if you need to um, give a report to the boss or send something to incident command or you know let your chief know the area that you covered. So the extractor will go through your images and pull out all the lat long information and altitude information that, that uh, is available and it will put it into any of the file formats that you see. So you've got a comma delimited file, you got a KML, KMZ, which is obviously Google Earth, you got GPX and GeoJSON. So if you're using SARTOPO, if you're using some of those packages, you can, you can automatically put it to a file format that it'll understand. So in this particular case, we've got it for KML, and it literally takes a couple of seconds to pull that information out and put it into a KML file that you can immediately open in a in in Google Earth, and it will put pin drops everywhere a picture is taken. So anyone can look at it. It doesn't make any difference whether they have any training or not, and they can look at it and tell what area you've covered. So as your area expands, if you have an expanding search going on, you can log each area sequentially and know that you've got 100% coverage and know how to allocate your resources. I mean, just this tool alone is something that has been very, very helpful. The second utility that we'll talk about is the video slicer. Everybody knows when you're looking at your drone, you're looking at a video stream that is coming in and you're watching it on your monitor. And uh, there are some people that, uh, um, go ahead and use the, record that video. Uh, obviously the video is much higher resolution at 4K, but the video slicer will allow you to pull full resolution still images from any video that you've captured. So what that means is if you look at this, you can set it up so that you can pull a still picture frame, still frame 
out of that video at say every one second or every five seconds or whatever frequency you want. And if you're running at uh, 1080, it's gonna be a five megapixel picture, essentially. Uh, if you're running at 4K, it's gonna be an eight megapixel picture. Obviously it's not as high a resolution as your 20 megapixel imager that comes with your you know, still imagery. But if, you, if that's all you have, that's certainly better than nothing. And that will allow Locate to process those images the same way. And we've done some altitude tests, and I'm sure everyone that has done any mapping knows a little bit about ground sampling distance. And uh, obviously with uh, 1080, your ground sampling distance is going to grow. But uh, we have discovered that uh, we, can, we can easily detect a five inch object, which is about that big around, from 150 to 200 feet, which is not bad, not bad at all. So there's those two tools and we'll go to the next two tools. Rapid scan is something that helps you essentially divide and conquer. We've gone out and we've taken 3,000 images or so. And if we use a mapping product like uh, the Pix4D Capture and it, and it is trying to produce a 3D map, uh, the overlaps are gonna be very, very high. Uh, 80% around in there is kind of typical. So what that means is with that amount of overlap, a single target in your area of view is gonna be covered in six images, essentially. Six images will have the same, th same target in it because of the overlap. Now, what you can do with rapid scan is you can, out of those 3,000 images, you can say, go out and pull me every fourth image. So that cuts that 3,000 images down to a quarter, which would even further reduce the amount of time that would be required for you to process it. Even though it, it you know, two images per second, that's not bad, but if you had to, you could uh, divide and conquer. And if you had four setups of locate running, if you had four computers, you could divide those up in quarters and give everybody a quarter and they all could be looking at a different color hue completely. You could, uh, you could set it up so that you had those four instances looking for something completely different. So it maximizes the use of those 3000 images. Now focus is uh, it's, it's an interesting tool. You got to do a little mapping with it. But say, for example, out of those 3,000 images right there in the center, you wanted to look at an area right in the center. So you can circle or you can draw a lasso around any area in that, that 3,000 images, and it will segregate those images for locate to process, which is, again, it gives you a focus, if you will, on a particular area so that you can get that done. If you have a high probability area or that sort of thing, then there you go. That will, would do it for you. Okay, and we're gonna wrap this thing up pretty quick. It was gonna be, a, we knew it was gonna be a pretty short one, but uh, we're gonna have some further discussion on this. Uh, locate is um, just was an answer to my long-standing request for a decade, literally a decade. Uh, it's And it's not just for search and rescue. Uh, as we stated in the beginning, we have been, uh, or I've, I've shown people how they could find invasive species like the little purple plant, uh, that sort of uh, detail is available. You can get that and pull it out. Uh, the, the folks at Locate are doing some, some really amazing things uh, and have some really amazing products on the near horizon that are going to change the way we look at images, very, very literally how we look at images. Um, I've been told that FieldView is going to be coming out. It's called Locate FieldView, and it will actually process the video stream that is coming in from your telemetry. So you don't have to wait. It's gonna be doing it live 
while you fly your aircraft. Now, this is a game changer because as you're flying it, even if you're getting 1080p back in, if you're flying at 150 feet, you could easily locate a person or you could locate a car or you could locate a boat or anything that is essentially larger than five inches. You can be notified while you're flying it so that you can stop the mission, maybe take a closer look, determine whether it's something that you need to have ground truth. Let your troops move in there while you move on. Uh, there are things on the horizon that uh, uh, are in development that are gonna change the way you even process the images. You may not even have to, to put a color in. You may be looking for anomalies. There's uh, artificial intelligence that could be uh, involved in this. These are all part of the very dynamic research that is going on with these folks at, at Locate. And the, the, the best part about it is, is it's picking up where our standard issue Mark I eyeball falls short because there's just, the numbers are too big. The, there's too many colors, there's, there's too many megapixels, there's too many pictures, and we need to be able to parse this data down so that we mere mortals can understand just exactly what's going on, what we need to get out of the, the situation, and uh, uh, how to make actionable intel out of these thousands of images that we have collected. So, with that, um, if there are any questions anybody would like to throw out, uh, we would be happy to take those questions. And if Leslie is standing by. I'm right here. Yeah, so we've gotten a, a couple questions in. Thank you so much, Jane. That was a great presentation. Um, one of the questions that someone submitted, sorry if there's a little bit of an echo, um, was what is one of the most popular use cases for Locate right now? Well, uh, Locate was designed and developed for search and rescue. Um, that's the main thing because, as you know, when we're out there flying, minutes matter. Literally, minutes matter. And that's been the holdup. Uh, we've known it for years. Um, uh, that's what it was designed for. And what's really surprised us is that Locate is a relatively young company. Uh, uh, the software itself was released April of last year. So it's just over a year old. And as we have people using it, they come up with some of the best ideas on how to use it outside of search and rescue. Uh, like one of the things that I mentioned was the invasive plant species. Who would have thought that you could have, you know, find a little purple flower and it would mean something to somebody. Um, also, we've been uh, asked to, to, can you figure out uh, the, the, the uh, sex of hemp plants, believe it or not. Apparently there is uh, some sort of feminization process that they go through and where they wanna weed out the males for some reason. I have no idea why this is above my pay grade, but uh, these sorts of new applications are coming out that we just, we never thought of. But again, we're, we're dealing with ones and zeros here, right? Th this is just computer data and a picture is worth a thousand words when you have different people look at it, they glean what they want out of it. Um, I've had geologists look at, at a picture and say, oh, there's this fault line here and yada, yada. Have a biologist look at it and say, oh, there's an ecotome right here. And, and it's the same picture. So they pull the data out of it that they need. And what Locate does is it gets it down even further and you can put the, those smarts, the people that have those smarts, you can set it up so that it, it works for them. So it's, it's been pretty exciting to be involved with this. I've been very blessed to be able to contribute just a little bit to, to getting this, this software package going. Yeah, well, it sounds like there are kind of a multitude of, of different uh, applications across different verticals, which is exciting to hear. Um, yeah. Let's see, we've got someone asked, um, how does the photo analysis work on photos where there might be poor lighting? Okay, again, I've learned more about taking pictures in the last two years and what goes on in a JPEG image than I ever would have thought about as a photographer in a prior lifetime and then trying to use JPEG images in search and rescue. Uh, lighting makes all the difference in the world. Quite frankly, 
you know, if uh, you have good lighting, you get good pictures. If you have bad lighting, you get bad pictures. Uh, but that doesn't stop locate. You just have to understand what happens to color when the lighting goes away. And not only that, uh, you have to know what goes on when you set a white balance. Uh, if you set it for sunny, uh, if you set it for overcast, if, if uh, you know, there, there are all sorts of, of uh, white balance um, categories in our drones that you can set. And it very definitely changes the color of everything that it looks at. So you have to be cognizant of how that works uh, if you're going to be in that situation. I mean, if, if typically you're shooting in a low light situation, you're going to figure out what works the best. And one of the things that one of my colleagues pointed out to me a long time ago was that you can take an underexposed picture and work with it, which is essentially what you're talking about with um, uh, well, poor exposure on, on an image. It's kind of mm -hmm. like looking at a piece of toast. You, know, you can take an unburned piece of toast and work with it. You can make it toastier, but you can't unburn a piece of toast, right? right. So that's the, the analogy that, that they used. So uh, it, it certainly is going to cause you to have to think more, but that does not preclude you from using Locate in, uh, in low-light situations. Good. Okay, um, we had someone else ask uh, if just that the slides will be available for download and the answer to that is yes, they will be. Um, someone asked um, if the output of Locate is format compatible with other applications. Okay, the, the, the formats that we have available now are first off, you have comma delimited, the CSV file that goes into an Excel spreadsheet. And typically you can take a common delimited format and pull it into just about everything. You just have to know how to format it. Uh, the other formats are KML, KMZ, uh, GeoJSON, and um, the other Garmin. Uh, it eludes me now, but there's one other format in there. But uh, for the most part, if you need to take it from one software package to another, uh, that doesn't handle one of those formats is typically it's going to be the common delimited format. Got it. Okay. Um, I think we have time for about two more. Let's see. Um, someone asked if locate, uh, can work with FLIR cameras. Aha. Uh -huh. I was going to mention that. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, we are currently working with the, the developers on this to, to uh, analyze FLIR imagery. And as you know, FLIR imagery is a lot lower resolution than what we're used to, but it can be more data rich because even at 640 by 512, which is what the highest FLIR resolution is we can work with, we can get radiometric data out of it. So yes, there is some work being done on that. And uh, that's gonna be one of the, the, the greater things that are gonna be coming out here probably that they advised me by, you know, fourth quarter, maybe first quarter of next year. So yeah, look forward to that. Clear is definitely gonna be a big player in here as well. Good, that's very exciting to hear. Um, the last question we got, um, let's see. Um, actually, we got a couple more. Let's see if we can do a couple more. Um, can users share color palettes? Absolutely. That is one of the really cool things about it. Um, we're doing some things right now. One of the, the, the public safety um, applications that we did is uh, for crime scene. And they asked if, can you find brass on the ground, uh, bullet, spent bullet casings? And uh, we said, well, let us look and let us try. And sure enough, uh, it will do that. So you can set up those brass, if you want them, color databases, and you can name them brass one, two, and three, and you can build a catalog of colors that work for you in your environment with your computer and with your cameras, which is really, really cool. And then after that, if there's somebody else who has the same sort of camera that you think it would help them with, sure, you can, you can send them out, they're very small, uh, they're very, again, very portable, very easily to send. You, send. you can send them over your, your cell phone if you wanted to. They're that small. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the color databases re reside in an uh, individual CRD file. 
that's the the color database file and uh you bet you can share them send them and uh, we encourage it perfect thanks um the last question i'm going to get to um someone just asked what the system requirements are to run locate on a windows okay that's what really <laughs> nice about this. <laughs> this one will run on anything from windows 7 oh my god all the way up to windows 10. Uh, it'll also run on mac ios or mac os um, uh, it doesn't take a real powerhouse to run this either. You don't have to have all sorts of memory. A standard laptop will run locate just fine. So if you got one kicking around that, uh, you know, you moved on to a better laptop because you got a gaming computer, then it'll, it'll run on that laptop. Now, that being said, if you have the latest Alienware laptop that has all the latest and greatest on it, then yeah, it'll really crank up the speed on it. So, Sure, uh, you know, go as, as low as you need to, run a Windows 10 all the way up to the, the real race horses and uh, rock and roll. Good, sounds like most, most windows are compatible then. Um, so I think with that, with that, that might be our time. Um, just as a reminder to our audience, uh, the presentation is available on demand within about an hour and you can actually just use the link that you used today to, to get in. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today, and thank you to Gene for, for presenting. You're more than welcome. I look forward to it. Take care.